Hello, internet. I, uh, I'm Matilda Park. I work on Urbit. I'm giving a talk today on making interfaces for peer-to-peer -peer communities. It's not distinctly about Urbit, though, like, you know, there'll be a bit of it about how we've, we've done things, but um, in, in general, it's not distinctly just about that. It's, it's sort of about where interfaces are going um, and sort of like the future of the net. Now, before I start, I want to confirm to Mr. Exile Server that this is all visible and cool and good. It is all visible. The coolness of it, I'm not so sure, but convince me. <laughs> OK. So I, I first gave this talk uh, at the Chaos Communication Congress um, a few months ago, uh, but it was very brief, like 15 minutes. And um, I am happy to give this again in a way that spells things out a bit um, more from like the ground level. This is going to be a very high interface talk. We're not talking about um, you know, like the relation of like the hierarchies of like headers to text or whatnot. This is like the high level sort of product decisions that come from like the the web stack underneath and how the web stack has sort of limited the ways that we think about these products. Okay, so um, first three here is describing single player computing. Uh, you know, the PCs that we have inherit decisions made from designing Unix in the seventies, which is the time sharing metaphor, and then you know Xerox and Macintosh gave us the desktop metaphor later. Uh, which was made for multiple users on one machine, centered around time-sharing cycles across single-user sessions. This pattern also replicates in the client-server relationship. Yeah. So time-sharing. Technically, time-sharing is just, you know, we have, uh, Unix machine has many different accounts with a supervisor process that everyone in the office uses an account on, and they all share its resources because computers are very expensive. And if we do that this way, then, you know, we can all have one monitor and one like we all have one monitor each and one computer in the back and we all treat it like it's ours and let's we let a, a complex computer somewhere else do the work without needing to own one ourselves now this was great in the 60s 70s 80s uh era because you know computers were the size of an office um and now everyone could have one but uh, they're also very expensive to use like you know like 300 dollars an hour uh but by doing this we all have a computer ourselves or we pretend that we do yeah so when it comes to the way that we use computers today, with the, with the internet, you know, we have the client's server relationship by and large through HTTP, which is that we serve files from a host, the server, to a client. And in the same way that it replicates itself in the client server relationship, it also replicates itself on centralized platforms interfaces. Um, how so? Well, if time sharing let many users use free cycles of a supercomputer, pretend it was theirs, then online platforms reify this exact same model. Like they, they make it quite literal. That is to say that we all have very complex devices that are acting as thin clients to single function computers, not literally single function, but like computers that we're, we are designing an interface to do one thing for that all live somewhere else. So because of that, we, be, we think that it's you know a very natural part of using a computer to have an account and to log into it. Um, and we all, we also do think it's very natural to, uh, to use a Chromebook or to network our, uh, our devices together, you know, through like the, um, the iCloud sort of array of devices, uh, through Apple and essentially the more that a company bases its business model around pretending to have one computer somewhere else and monitoring your usage, uh, the more that their hardware devices are veering towards thinner sort of layouts. So, you know, you'll see that MacBooks have like 128 gigs of storage. Um, when honestly people are using, you know, terabytes upon terabytes, but it's just, you don't really get any benefit out of doing so because it's not very easy to share your files across from that one computer elsewhere. They want you to just sort of pay, you know, a buck a month, get your 50 gigs of shared space and uh, get a whole bunch of, of thin clients that are tether you to that company. However, like, why is it acceptable that we end up using these 12 chat clients with 12 usernames and passwords just because your friends are owned by different services? Now, of course, you know, if you ask any, any major company, they're going to say it's very easy. All it requires is that everybody in the world use our thing, and we'll solve the problem. Um, and in the case of like a single context application, like, you know, imagine that you're invited to a Discord uh, community. Like, you know, you want to do something together. You want to play a tabletop game together, or you want to voice chat with somebody, or you want to you want to just like share a life with other people. And by integrating, you know, a big array of bots, you can you can integrate these inf like information from the outside world into your Discord or 
you know, if you make like a library room, you can dump your PDF files or your links to like Google drives or like your air tables full of like, you know, ebook files somewhere else. But like, you know, inside of discord or inside of Slack or whatever, everything is just a message, you know, it's just temporary, unlinkable, transient information. And getting outside of that context requires you to basically add another service that does one thing that has a completely new set of off uh, and, you know, like no sense of the graph that want to do that function together. In the last few years, we've had some additional services appear. Uh, instead of one context, they swap in these interfaces as necessary and they create sort of this modular approach to having a consistent set of data on one machine by you know flipping out interfaces they uh they abstract what is basically multiple products or multiple conceptions of of how we conceive of products right now into a framework product that has a massive complexity cost for one machine and replicates the same issues elsewhere and that you still have to if you want to exit like this like frankenstein product you have to sort of add another service on top of it um, or you need to just keep extending the Frankenstein machine until it pops, you know? So on the left-hand side here, there's like some, some clippings from, uh, from Notion, which lets you sort of bolt on like to-do lists and tables and, uh, wiggies and, um, I don't think they do chat yet, but a whole bunch of information that coordinates as a knowledge base across a set of people, but can't really do anything else. And then on the right-hand side here, there's the uh, glide apps, which actually position themselves as... Uh, interchangeable interfaces based upon a Google Sheet. So you give them a spreadsheet and they'll make you a, a React Native app um, that is customized to whatever your Google Sheet is. Um, anyway, so for those of us who are uh, in the decentralization space, this is quite obvious, but you know, when it comes to people who are not in the decentralization space, um, it's based upon sort of a resistance against sort of these ideals of the internet collapsing into just me talking to Google, talking to you, uh, and figuring out ways in which uh, nodes on a, on a graph can connect together in more of a, a mesh array, or you know, uh, in a more federated model even. Those are three different approaches, but ideologically, decentralization, it looks toward personal freedom, transparency, and balanced power dynamics, because in the centralized case, it kind of veers toward um, abstracting away these freedoms uh, being very opaque and having no power at all over the things that you are trusting to, to another agent. But because of this, it also demands its own concept of a user interface in turn that we currently are only starting to reach into because we favored more modular approaches to decentralizing our interfaces. Now, I will explain what this means, so don't worry. This modular approach is, is that we are sort of adding another layer on top of, of the internet stack in which one program is connecting in a peer-to-peer -peer array. It al allows for agency and freedom on a small scale. It's more manageable to solve problems as just an app on top of the pre-existing stack. So if we're actually going to decentralize the lower layers, as I'm going to argue that you know Urbit is, but also that I think a whole wide array of services are in a a more hodgepodge manner, then I think that the interface challenge is still ahead of us and hasn't really been properly considered yet. So I want to talk about the last few years and sort of the competitors to the social network sphere, um, and as I say, our decentralization approaches. Uh, so when we solve for everyday users, we often settle for a federated model. That is to say, you know, I and a whole bunch of other people, like maybe 10, 15 people, live on one box that itself is decentralized among a whole a lot of other boxes. It's like municipalities as opposed to houses talking uh, directly. But this is because that peer-to-peer -peer has a high cost to the user. So when you when you talk about decentralization right now, people often talk about the Fediverse, you know, Mastodon, Pleroma, which still uses HTTP and DNS, and it has a landlord model. That is to say that it has the same problems and incentives as the internet right now, but it uses a smaller area of abstraction. As I said, the, the municipality argument. It creates a thousand tiny Twitters instead of having my machine talk to your machine. And you can see on the left-hand side here is the admin panel from Mastodon, in which you have, you know, you can see all of the users and what they've imp like how much they've been posting. You can see reports about your users, and you can really, you know, you can see your users' uh, private messages if you want, but your users know you personally. 
And so they sort of just trust you instead of trusting, you know, Jack or trusting Mark or, you know, the like. On the right-hand side here, you can see the decentralization graph for a Fediverse instance. If you go to Fediverse.space, you can see any instances sort of position on the map and the little post, post boxes that talk to each other or don't talk to each other. And so it creates this uh, very interesting international relations sort of thing in which different different municipalities don't like other different municipalities. And like, while there isn't really like a, like a sub federation, there's like um, a sort of a, a set of ideals that different, different municipalities are, are associated with. And that, you know, there's like this ongoing little war, about who can talk to whom? Um, and that sort of positions uh, a, a major decision on the user's part to pick the right landlord and to uh, sort of infer the culture of your municipality. Scuttlebutt, on the other hand, is fully peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, it's, it's quite high friction, though, in my opinion, in that it creates identities only on your machine. It uses a gossip protocol to dynamically sort of have the, the network phase in as if through a fog of war. And it creates that sort of narrow interface to this, what is essentially a peer-to-peer -peer swarm as a pending to a log uh, without a verifiable identity store without a central server. So you can see on the right-hand side here that what you end up seeing is that people make four or five different accounts uh, depending on the devices. You know, if I have my desktop computer, my laptop computer, my my tablet, and my phone, that's four different accounts. They all have uh, like a 256 character hash that I have to give out, or you have to like sort of naturally discover. There's no way of really associating these identities together or verifying that they're all me. And uh, of course, you know, there's the obvious thing where you don't really delete or edit information. It's just uh, you're appending to a swarm now. For both of these services, Mastodon and Pluroma, I, I want to uh, and Scuttlebutt, I want to like emphasize that I use both of them every day, um, but they are essentially uh, trade-off solutions that deal with the fact that uh, it's very hard to directly network our machines together, even though that is arguably sort of what the earliest users of the internet sought to do, like in the you know 80s, 90s, not really that early, but you get the idea. So, you know, the lesson that we learned from these approaches is that the internet systematically does not incentivize direct ownership to everyday people. It is simply much easier to abstract your online life into this model and to accept the trade-offs. However, this is sort of like the, the worst possible solution because uh, this reality is in direct opposition to the core values of the internet's earliest users. It also leads to simpler and simpler computers programmatically tangled in this present with increasingly complex systems to monitor them. What do I mean by this, this sort of uh, haiku here? Uh, even though our computers are, are very complex, they are made to do simpler and simpler things. It's the Facebook machine future and that I have this $2,000 rig that would make any M like MIT researcher in the 60s envious. And all I can do with it is append to a log somewhere else and, and transmit things as a client to a host server because it is just impossible like to do anything more than that directly with somebody else. And because of that complexity, we're tangling these incredibly complex but simple machines together in this present through uh, you know paid subscription plans or uh, consistent identities that store more and more of our lives in them. And the systems that coordinate these things underneath have to become increasingly complex to do more and more basic things. So... One alternative approach is the one that I work on, which is to say Urbit. It's a peer-to-peer -peer internet. It takes a systematic approach to constructing a peer-to-peer -peer internet in that we branched off computational history and we believe in constructing the entire stack around our modern use cases, human-scaled networks while containing complexity. It's, it's essentially a very well-principled uh, identity uh, sort of identity stack and peer-to-peer uh, -peer network stack that coordinate together to create a well-permissioned hierarchical swarm that uses the internet like the internet used phone lines. You can see here that what we're doing is uh, that that entire like fossil stack underneath of it is a uh, is the current internet stack. But essentially, much like the uh, much like the modular approaches that you see um, in in the past here, we also sort of create like an overlaying set of protocols. Uh, to make our swarm, but we're really doing it all just to cultivate and to preserve small communities doing things with their computers together directly. 
and just writing off the things underneath as the internet wrote off the phone line. Of course, if we can adjust the systematic incentives of the network to keep it friendly by default, even better. So for, interface, for our interface sort of problems ourselves, if everybody is running their own computer and speaking directly to each other, you have to plan your UI around a wide net of small groups. That is to say, centralized platforms are really good at presenting and measuring aggregate information. But this is very hard to verify across a swarm of peers. Like every product we consider right now, like Instagram or Reddit or anything that, that has uh, a number that goes up across everybody on the network. It's because everybody on the network is a client talking to one server that can see the total, the total number of submissions, the total uh, plus ones on on the submissions to the log, you know. But if you have a peer to peer network that essentially is gradually loosening as if through a fog, then you can't really verify things in aggregate. And for every user involved, like they might want to opt out of the rest of the network entirely. I mean, their their internet and their computer. Could just be the size of the rest of their lives like just you know a handful of people or at most dunbar's number like 150 and that's that it makes an internet that's sort of like a whole bunch of tiny little dense mes meshes but no real central master so when it comes to the interface how do you build for a community outside of our single context application and how could this interface ever really become a product as we currently imagine them. After all, today's conception of product revolves around many single function, account segregated mega computers. That is to say that we're designing our products around being hosted on a server that does one thing or that flips out interfaces that all do one thing, that segregates many different accounts on one machine and makes everything that, that is complex uh, live on the server, not on the client. But all the clients are extremely powerful. We all have powerful machines. It's just not easy for them to talk to each other with our current stack. So when it comes to product, our current tack is of imagining a shared desktop of file context and a shared directory. Now that's a whole bunch of, of words that we need to sort of unpack there. But you can see right now that other products are also heading in this direction. Like if you've seen Beaker Browser, um, and especially the things that they're doing on, on YouTube right now. They have some footage of, of their upcoming release. I'm not sure if it's already out yet, but uh, in that they're flipping out sort of uh, interfaces that represent sort of text files on a shared directory. And so if, yeah, and, and that yeah. protocol as well. Yeah, yeah. I, it's just the most uh, latent example I have in my mind. But I, I do know that there's a, a bunch of stuff in the, in the DAP world too. I'm just not as familiar with it. Um, you know, the secondary issue becomes uh, persistent, verifiable identity alongside these files plus components and that these things become more and more uh, tightly, tightly wound together, but sort of m more easily made into like a tapestry, you know? Um, so if you can't guarantee that everybody has the same UI, you have to permission and define your read and write patterns within file types per group. Um, so, you know, for backend, you're defining and you're structuring the group's shared data. But on the front end, you are letting the individual or the group shape and inherit an interface from an extensible component library. So that's to say that we are saying, you know, these types of files should be read and written to this way. And the interface is one of these different types that are themselves sort of like componentized uh, types that are represented across, you know, a JavaScript interface or, you know, like a GTK toolkit or something in Vala if you're on like elementary, but you get the idea. So for us, we, we currently believe that a peer-to-peer -peer interface then demands target agnostic, extensible components for file types within shared specific application contexts. Now I'm gonna break this down. Target agnostic extensible components for file types means that you're depicting an interaction with a file type that functions regardless of the interface. So. You know, you're defining your interaction across web, across native mobile code, but you're also depicting what can be extended with, with additional metadata and what can be combined in front end and stored in back end. So say that uh, we're defining like a context that is like a chat room and an e-reader and, you know, uh, a terminal, you know, you, you can you can define that as essentially a group's context. If you go back here to this uh, this little graphic, you can say that this group wants its desktop 
to be these things woven together in a, in a, in like a, a tapestry sort of way. Um, and then that is owned by the group's shared directory and the different parts that are made into the, ta into the sort of tapestry in the front end on the back end look like uh, defined file types that uh, declare the components they want um, across any different kind of interface. So you'd have to sort of rewrite a component in native mobile code or rewrite a component in web and prepare for that same sort of tapestry, whether or not it's like a Tmux instance if you're doing CLI or like uh, a window manager uh, that tiles things as if it were like i3. Yeah, I think I just sort of uh, declared this. So a set of components becomes a context for a group of people. Together, we combine components to have a chat room, an annotated ebook library, and a message board, and we declare their interfaces as parts of the files we store, and we share them peer to peer. So I want to also emphasize that we have a whole lot of uh, features that are happening all at once. Um, like, does it always have to be a full stack solution? Do we always have to, to start from scratch? I mean, uh, on the project I work on, we were taking that tack, but I have seen many online sects exploring sort of solutions from the past, you know, Plan 9 or Gopher. You know, they're integrating the old with the new. I'm not sure if you've seen, uh, uh, I don't think it's called Ninefront, but there's um, a resurgence of using Plan 9 to essentially share componentized interfaces together. Uh, I think it was on the, the technology board of 4chan, I think is where it came from. But I'm also on, on the Fediverse, I'm seeing a lot of my colleagues sort of hosting Gopher sort of uh, protocol links and, and trying things out in that sort of context too. So in this case, like how can we best integrate together regardless? Uh, I think it's sort of the question that's on everybody's minds, but uh, in general, like I'm interested in seeing where it's going. Uh, all right, so that's my Twitter. That's my Fediverse handle. That's me in orbit, and these are two links. And uh, that is the talk. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to do questions now. Uh, what a great overview. Um, as I mentioned, when we first started speaking, I never actually uh, got uh, sort of used Orbit. And I've been watching it develop. I, I you know, been paying attention uh, to, the, to the path and the advances and everything and how it's, how it's developed. This is a really, really good overview um, of showing all of the threads that, that you're paying attention to um, in the Fediverse. Um, I think there's, there's two things that, 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 um, stick with me. One, so having been one of the guys that's, I've been online since 81, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like ARPANET and, uh, times and, um, also being one of the guys that jumped at the chance to show, uh, to, to design and implement advertising models for the monetization of the web, which is probably the one thing that I would say I would chop out of my past and wish that I had never done. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> being involved with, with, uh, with uh, commercializing and monetizing MP3, uh, watching BitTorrent uh, develop and take on the whole you know, copyright thing and all the things that have, that have gone around that. What sticks with me is, is, is two things. First of all, that people like to, to, to be in aggregate. Yeah. Being in aggregate and having the eyeballs is why it is that YouTube works. It's why it is that Twitter works. It's why it is that Facebook works is because it's an aggregated portal. And we know what the trade-off is about that. Um, so... The, the question for, for me is, and I, and I guess it seems to be a central question that you're tackling here, is how do you provide a unified user experience and a unified interface for a diverse set of users so that we have that feeling of being an aggregate and not being splintered municipalities or villages or whatever? And it just seems to be the central uh, design question that you're looking to solve it or bit. Yeah, sure. I I want to clarify that like I, I don't think these things are necessarily equal. Like I when it comes to YouTube or you know, it's more like Wikipedia than it is like Facebook or something. You know, it, it's that YouTube posits itself as a an information store. And 
when it comes to services like Facebook and Twitter, like Twitter itself posits itself as like, you know, what's happening. It's a source of information, but people use it as a sort of a, there's like a, a Delusian term for this, like a big, a big smooth space, you know, like, uh, like a, in that there are these very, very fuzzy delineations of like, you know, weird Twitter or like crypto Twitter or like, but that's not just, just another version of the different 4chan boards. In yeah, I'm, getting, I'm, I'm getting better, Mr. Surfer. Uh, in that those are municipalities, like is what I'm trying to say. In that right now, we're seeing people sort of receding into municipalities. They're they're going into discords. They're going into, I've seen like a few people on Keybase even. Um, but they're they're sort of networking in private. They're going into dark messages. They're they're hiding away uh, and treating uh, these, these platforms as uh, declarations or or like sort of mimetic warfare spaces. Um, but that's it isn't really- totally That's sort of like, digital tribalism, for sure. I, I, totally, I totally see that and agree with you, yeah. Well, I mean, I, it's not like the, the world isn't just about like, like being piloted by, uh, by your ideas and like warring against other ones. It's about like hanging out with your friends, you know? Like it's about the, the everyday interactions between you and me. But because the best we can do is sort of like aggregate everything and flatten it into information, then, you know, like, like, the things that we're doing or uh, to each other in regards to communication don't really coordinate well in terms of being flattened to just managing information. Like the, what I've found is that the younger people got, the more that they were implicitly talented on managing their information. Like they were better at filtering their Twitter feeds. They were more resistant to redundant information. When I was first, uh, my first job was uh, more of like a social media person for Tinai. And uh, I recall my, my boss's, uh, being very, very uh, upset when they saw redundant information. Like, they just could not handle it. And they wanted us to not post redundant things across different platforms ourselves. But to me, it was like, well, that's just obvious. Like, everybody, everybody's everybody knows how to, like... Do you remember the, the classic thing that when you, make a, when you make a presentation, you need to present it? I learned this in debate class. You need to tell what people what you're going to tell them. Yeah. Then you need to tell them, and then you need to told them, tell them what you told them for them to remember it. And it's that, it's that kind of redundancy that you were probably pursuing and not just re repeat, you know, repeating ad infinitum. It's just that different people live in different spaces, but all these different spaces are declaring themselves to be the one and only sort of source of information, like your source of truth. This is where the bulletin board for the town is, and the town is the entire world. Um, so to go back to the point that I, that, I, that I made about the mistake that I feel that I made in my, my internet, internet and communications history, Mm -hmm. in monetizing in monetizing uh, the web is that we haven't discovered a way when we talk about reputation as coin there's all the blockchain implementations um there's keybase which is yeah. right, reputational coin uh or any of the social networks that that you participate in um in dealing with these systemic designs and recognizing the sociological aspect of it how do you anticipate this disconnect being solved? How do we get the benefits of the advertising model, yeah, mm -hmm. without all of the weight of the investment required in the stakeholder model? How do we allow people to frictionlessly per, um, uh, participate in aggregate data that has, people are always going to want curators, right? I mean, you yeah. got to meditate from friends when you were a kid. And now you get Spotify playlists, people like aggregation and curators. So what's the model, yeah, that gives us an aggregate interface to all of those diverse communities or municipalities or interest areas or, uh, you know, signaling? Do you, Man, see, I, do you see it yet? I you're don't. asking about futurism, um, which is sort of like, I, I can talk about what I think the future, where the future is going. I can talk about what I prefer, um, I guess, but it might, yeah, be, it might, it might be fun to like to debate these things in the, in the interim because we have a little bit of time left, I think. Yeah. We have um, so I, I actually think that we're going toward more of like a, uh, an interpersonal canon model and that like, you know, we, we just had a century in which uh, there was mass broadcast media, mass celebrity, and... Uh, a one-way ticket to, to fame was just getting on the radio or getting on TV or getting on movies or whatnot. And now that information is so common, um, the more specific, the more meaningful it is. And so, and so we're sort of seeking out sort of an information locality, or I am anyway. I'm finding that I'm often f uh, finding books that are incredibly meaningful to me, but that I can't really find anywhere in Toronto. 
I need to like order them custom made by like a, a specific tiny publisher somewhere in like, you know, rural UK or something. And there's like 12 people yeah. on the internet. I mean, also, as a kid, like, we had fanzines. Yeah. You know, well, I think it's all going in that direction. That you had to go to the record store to get from some guy in Topeka. Yeah. You know? And so there are some things that are like that belong to a central store, like it, like a library of Alexandria. And I think that Wikipedia and YouTube are all doing great jobs at this. I wish that Google Books still existed. And I wish that, you know, there's some sort of successor to it because we do or need to Google Reader. Word. Yeah. Um, but beyond that, I think that like the the pursuit of of like very tiny communities with like their own celebrities, not only has that already happened, but it's going to become more and more prevalent. Like I think that the notion of like mass influencer is going to be less common. And while you might still you might still have like things like Spotify, um, I actually think that things like Bandcamp might become more prevalent too. Do you remember? Do you remember the Clue Train Manifesto from Doc Searles and and that whole group? Uh, kind of like the it was similar to the cypherpunk uh, manifesto from from Perry Barlow that that, no, stated, no, that is. Oh, you should definitely check out the Clue Train manifesto. Just Google it, and it's online. Uh, I think you should dive into that and have that as part of your of, of your mental map. But talking about these same things, so this the long tail came out of the Clue Train mass, uh, 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 manifesto. How all this stuff fractures and you know percolates out and and all of and that's what YouTube was essentially about was monetizing the long tail of all of these diverse interest groups before it dove into the algorithmic uh, uh, delivery of uh, autoplay and delivering you what it is based on what it is that you watch instead of just delivering you a diverse yeah. program, right? I guess I, I think the a good example I can give right now is is what I've noticed over the past like week, and that is to say that there's all these like second lifestyle platforms now. Like I, I've seen two different ones. Like when we were, um, you know, us at Urbit, we were showing something off last night in a talk, and there were people watching it in a, like a, a VR sort of sphere. They had their own little, their own little amphitheater, uh, and there's like f over 50 people in there. And I'm seeing now, you know, like uh, Noncon has has some stuff in crypto voxels, which actually, I'm not sure if you've tried it on your on your phone, but it runs really great on your phone. Um, but like, there 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 demonstrates there a like. A desire for an online locality or to co-experience, uh, you know, with other people, to, to to witness other people experiencing as you also experience, and two, to watch something that is sort of specific to their interest sphere, and that they've they found an interest group, and they're creating something meaningful around positioning one person as a as a broadcaster to a small set of people, um, and so. What we're doing right now is we're using like a big wide array, like a big net of things to do that. We're using Jitsi, we're using uh, the CryptoVoxel service, we're using, you know, I, I have like this like bridge in Discord, but I'm not sure what the actual like host is. Like is that IRC besides that or not? Uh, no, it's 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 not. It's um, I forgot what Yash, Titan Embeds is their own is their own Discord server essentially. Yeah. Oh. I just mean like it's like um it's two, it's two different chats is what I mean but they're but they're combined. If you look but... at it in Discord and if you look at it in in our embed, it's different. That's something that we couldn't get together actually before we actually launched this. It's yeah. kind of an annoying detail yeah. in the implementation. All all I mean to say by that is just that um, the future is either essentially that, but multiplied over and over again, and that there's like more and more and more tiny little function services that are are being cast into a net that comprises a locality that is like extremely sort of like transcendent like there's like there's like no no formalization it's just do you live on these platforms or not and like you know the same so part, of the, part of the vision that we're elsewhere. looking for with what it is that we started with inner spaces is it's actually built in a modular way that yeah. this is plug and play you can configure it you can say when you launch an inner space yeah on yeah a Docker instance with a uh, with a configuration file. You select what do you want? You want uh, you want Keybase. You want Slack. You want Mattermost. You want you know whichever sort of thing, and you get that module where your community lives. And it, they already have the i they already have the login, the credentials, the IDs, and so yeah. it's, and you can have multiple ones. And this is another. Uh, I think that you probably um, remember Adium. Yeah. Right. So where. Where is the adium for, for Web3, right? We have all of these community. We have status, right? We have, all, we have different messaging clients, secure scuttlebutt, all of these different gossip protocols and all these things. 
actually we're still looking at going and, and you have matrix right which communicates with everybody and you have the bridges we're actually looking at going back to the roots of irc because yeah. in the end the only thing that's that's been approved upon is the ui and the ux and we're at the point now where we can design any ui and ux with react components or whatever it is to deliver what it is whatever it is that we want whichever thing so my dream would be in a place like like this is that you you log in and you just click on the buttons where you're already authenticated and you get that you get that information flow from all the communities that you're already registered in and you bring those people yeah. with you into the new virtual environment that you're coming in so not only are you communicating with the people that you haven't yet met in this interface you're communicating with the people that you already communicate with so that you don't have to be going to all those different clients yeah i mean like uh, that just to be demonstrates that you get it like it's like that there, there is essentially a modular hub service. Uh, not, you know, like a, it creates sort of a, a, a an intellectual venue. You know, like a, this is a place where I live, and like it has all these things that I need in a modular array. And uh, it depends on whether or not you would prefer that we have like an ADM future in that uh, we're just combining very disparate protocols together, or whether or not you want these things to be like a basic, basic computing primitive, or like a more common one. Like per personally to me, I think things like being able to like communicate files to somebody else's machine should be as easy as email. Um, you know, Remember more so LimeWire? Or... Sorry? Remember LimeWire? <laughs> that's like, that's different though. That's like, you have a... Well, I just, I just gave permissions to my local hard drive uh, of folders that were that were given permissions in my in my finder, you know. I mean, it's it's much like what you're doing is like we're doing that than giving that permission to Apple or Google. You're giving the hash of like of like your your machine and like your file to like a, a central index and letting the index be searchable for every user uh, connected to the mesh, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Like the the way that we've sort of like I just want to clarify a bit of a distinction here. Uh, like the way that we've done things and the way that you're, we're going to see these things be more commonly done in things like Beaker is that in things like Beaker, you can either have like this big long hash or you could use Namecoin or something. I know that uh, Namecoin recently, did they actually get into Tor browser yet or was that like a... Yeah. Yeah. Like that, that's a, that is one way of solving the problem, like bolting on like completely on, on, uh, uh, on mnemonic identities with like accessing things in peer-to-peer -peer ways. But um, what we're doing is essentially like to have a hierarchical swarm is to say that you have a very easily rememberable name that the shorter it is indicates where it is on, on, on this like big tree. And if I want to find a specific person, it just goes up the tree until it finds someone who knows where you are. Um, so these are things that are rememberable, that are all well permissioned and that everything is like hidden away besides uh, like things that you want to share with other people and are only accessible through just like constantly heart beating upward. And all of these steps in the tree are easily migratable and that they're consensually defined as to who is under whom uh, at any given time. So there's one, there's one big reference here that we've yet to mention and yet sure. to go into, and that's Xanadu. <laughs> 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 Hypercard. Yeah. So we all we all want that feature, I think. I mean, I do. I'm sorry. I think we all want that feature in some way or another, like the the dream of that feature, like. Yeah. So there's 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 uh, there's total uh, you know roots in in those concepts in in Urbit as well. Yeah. yeah. I uh, I've heard that Plan Nine and Urbit mix like oil and water or something, but like I uh, I think that there's a lot we can like get out of the resuscitation of like these movements together. I'm trying to figure out any good closing remarks here. I mean, uh, I'll, I guess I can show the slide one more time and then we can pass it on. But uh, essentially, if you want to find out more about me or more about any of this stuff, this is where I live. This is where we live. Um, and otherwise, I think I'm done in like two minutes. So do, should we move on to the uh, the Crypto Voxels Hangouts? Or? Matilda, <laughs> thank you. So much to 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 reaching out to speak, and I really look forward to uh, communicating and collaborating with you in the future. NonCon 2021 will be in Austria.
it will happen.